Hey guys, this is Michael David Ward coming at you from the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John and Pete. Hey man, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Tell us about what you're working on lately, man. Well, let's see. What I've been working on lately is a, a project based on a character I named Louine. Louine comes from the word Halloween, and it's a goth female action heroine that is fighting against the dark forces of evil. Besides that, I still paint. Uh, I do a lot of paintings based on Star Trek and Star Wars entertainment properties. I've done stuff for the studios. That's pretty much what I spend my time working on, but I'm moving more and more into graphic novels, telling basically stories yeah. with pictures and, and words. There are a lot of folks out there who are inspired by entertainment properties. And when you say, oh, yeah, I paint stuff based on Star Wars and Star Trek, your works of art have hung in Gene Roddenberry's house. Yes, yes. Uh, I was really fortunate to get officially involved with Star Trek because uh, some time ago, this was back in the 90s, I was working for Hewlett Packard. I was a technical writer, and I decided to leave technical writing the corporate world to pursue my art career. And I started to do these really cool, really different paintings based on a medium called reverse glass. Yeah. And um, I, I paint on the back of glass these really wild space scenes. And the reason I paint on glass is because it has a depth that you can't get with any other medium. And just by chance, whether you want to call it synchronicity, um, uh, coincidence. We were calling it a lot of things over dinner. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Fate. I ended up showing my work in a gallery in Beverly Hills. And the owners of the gallery ended up participating at a benefit dinner. I think it was a Jack Benny benefit dinner for... Uh, on behalf of Gene Roddenberry. And they sat right next to him, and they, and they showed him, him my work, and he was so interested in it, he wanted to actually come to the gallery and take a look at my work. And so that one event ended up k uh, kicking off my whole career with Star Trek. And what I find interesting about that is, prior to that, I was doing a lot of drawings with my artwork, kind of wishing, boy, how could I do something for Star Trek I'd love to do my own depictions of their property using my art style. And just out of the blue, I get a call from those those gallery owners saying that, guess what, guess who's coming to your art show in Beverly Hills? And I go, who? And they said, Gene Roddenberry. And I go, oh, my gosh. I mean, what are the odds of that, right? right. Yeah. And so from there, um, Gene Roddenberry came to the gallery. He really liked my work. In fact, I even have a video of he and I meeting for the first time and interacting, sharing all the paintings with him. And then he invited me to, this, um, to the Paramount lot and on the set of The Next Generation. What the it hell? crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. And I got to uh, tour the whole set, the bridge, the whole thing. You're hanging out with Gene Rodman. I'm hanging out with Gene Rodman, one of my, my childhood heroes. And sure. I grew up watching Star Trek. Of course, yeah. And so... That would be like if I liked painting uh, murals of Aztec chicks mm -hmm. on the side of my <laughs> lowrider van. Right. <laughs> and suddenly uh, I'm, I'm at a car show doing a mural on the side of a Ford Econo line with my Aztec presence, you know, yeah. my hands on my hips, yeah. headdress and whatnot, right. and a beautiful... <laughs> a voluptuous woman hanging onto my leg. I like it. And uh, and Hef shows up. Man, I'd like to buy this van. Exactly. Right. And then and then I go, wait a minute, aren't you Hef? And he says, yeah, man, I'm Hef. Do you want to come out, hang out? I'll show you the grotto. Yes, the grotto. <laughs> the That's the equivalent grotto. of that. So just in case there are people out there who aren't Star Trek fans, I don't know who those eight people are, but uh, my wife's one of them. She's in the next room. Um, but uh, it, just in case you don't understand the scope of what we're talking about here, when you paint something based on an entertainment property, and right. they have Gene Roddenberry yeah. say, yeah, man, I dig it. I dig it. Come check. Hey, you know what? It's get. This week is Bring My Favorite Artist to Work Day. 
Well, I can tell you that it was uh, definitely a jaw-dropping experience. Yeah. Uh, I, I had to pinch myself being on the set of Star Trek and then on – he yeah, won't yeah. say this, but you know what? He <laughs> want, He was wandering around and yeah. stumbled into the dressing room of Seven of Nine. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, and yeah. She was in My there. favorite Borg. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and she was in there. I'd, I'd say uh, making her way between two and a half and three. <laughs> right when Michael stumbled in and went, oh, oh. My bad. I'm sorry. My good. I'd like to paint you. My goodness, yes. Well, well, that's one opportunity. Unfortunately, I didn't really get to experience, but hey, you know. She's not around anymore as Seven of Nine, so That's I guess true. that one's gone. Yeah. But to take it uh, even further, it's pretty interesting. Um, after Gene gave me a, a tour of part of the set, he, then he invited me to have lunch with him yeah. uh, in the Paramount Cafeteria. And after that, he acquired one of my original paintings, and we we made kind of a pact where he allowed me to make prints of this painting, and he authorized his signature on the prints. Wow. And so my, I have a bunch of prints out there with Gene Roddenberry's signature on it. Huh. And then uh, after that, he actually invited me to his home in Bel Air. Jeez. And uh, I got to hang out you with him. You did get to house. see the grotto. Yeah, his grotto. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Bel Air's a good neighborhood. I don't know if there is an equivalent to that. That would be like if Hef said, you know what I'm going to do? Yeah. I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to take, uh, what was his wife's name? Mrs. Half? Mrs. Half, yeah. I'm going to yeah, take which Mrs. Wife? Half, and I'm going to stamp her ass print on the right right above the exhaust pipe of your Ford Econoline van. Kimberly Conrad. Right. Yeah. Her. Or, or one of the other one ones. Of them. Barbie Benton. Who gives a shit? Yeah. One of them. And, uh, but, yeah, man, that's terrific. Yeah, and it was so great. Can you say uh, what transpired beyond that was did you have like a working relationship at all with them where you would be privy to other things that were coming or uh to a to a minor degree it with regard to the show not so much but what it did do was it opened up the doors for me to now create a bunch of artwork for paramount um yeah my work was licensed on all kinds of posters prints um merchandise wow um, Collector plates, uh, mouse pads, all kinds of products like that. Well, people can go to your Facebook page, Michael David Ward, and look right. at your uh, cover photos and things like that because some of that out- artwork is displayed there. So you can go see it and see what it looks like, not in anything resembling its gl- full glory because, like you said, the painting on glass gives you a depth that you can't, you can't communicate on a Facebook photo. Yeah. But at least people can see and understand the subject matter and the appeal of the subject matter and mm-hmm. see why Gene Roddenberry saw it and went, Oh, Oh, Michael gets it, which I think is an enormous compliment. Um, I was uh, once a, uh, minor, uh, partner in a business that sponsored, uh, Star Trek convention. No way. Nice. Really? Wow. Yeah. And that was a large part of my world was the conventions. Which well, we can I'll tell talk you, about. man, they were, it was a world that I had no familiarity, uh, familiarity with and was in my first exposure, which was at, uh, it was in Las Vegas. So it was, it was big. Yes. And I didn't understand the size and scope of this event. How long ago was this? But, um, oh, sheesh. Uh, I don't know, maybe 98. Okay, because it's huge in Las Vegas. I was the um, I was the mouthpiece of the company that was the title sponsor. Wow! Of the um, of the event, and so that meant that I uh, I got to introduce uh, the discussion that was the finale of the event, which was a you know it was just a stage discussion with uh, Leonard Nimoy and uh, William Shatner. Oh wow! So cool. I didn't get to hang out with them, but I did get to say, ladies and gentlemen, you know, and I had the floor i was responsible for delivering this you know little address uh before it happened so i had to do 10 to 15 minutes before introducing them which was you know i thought hey this is great and then i got in the room and i went holy shit this room is enormous and there were chairs as far as the eye could see and i had a powerpoint presentation which was pretty (laughs) was pretty cute you know because 
I was taking pictures around that thing, and of course, what I was taking pictures of was a chick that was dressed at seven at nine, who was hot as hell. This she was, sm- oh, man. And then you know, I got to she was the she was my callback. So throughout the presentation, I would be like, and then this hot chick, and I would go back to her, and I embarrassed the hell out of her in that way that would make her show up the next day and be like, "Oh, you embarrassed me so much," and I was That's like, right. "I love this job." <laughs> Thank you, five of nine. Yes. Come on over. Taco bar is open. Taco bar is open. So, you know, that was a hell of an experience. But just the culture of that event and the fraternity that exists there, because those folks who attend the event and really go for it and, you know, dress like a Klingon and take the Klingon speech classes. and Yeah. I mean, it's it's intense. It is intense. And they take it seriously. They take it seriously and they support each other in taking it seriously. Well, what's cool about it, uh, John, is because they – why they're so passionate about Star Trek is it because it, it points to a, a hopeful future, right, mm-hmm. where everybody's getting along. Yeah. And, uh, right. you know, seeing past all this, the differences and all the divisiveness that's going on. And I, I love the way that they are able to point out the divisiveness in a way that's not – threatening or accusatory or mm-hmm. you know anything like that like Preachy, these, didactic, these yeah. damn klingons and you know the romulans or whoever it is you know when really they're a euphemism for the whatever ethnic group yeah. someone chooses to signal uh, single out and mm-hmm. if you look at it and you really uh take a good look at yourself you go you know what god damn it maybe that's me mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know maybe i'm the ass that doesn't like right. romulans yeah, I'm sure all of us are to one degree or another at some stage in our life, right? Yeah, yeah. Working to evolve. So it did show us uh, an evolved world. Mm-hmm. And you know what? I plant one right on Uhuru's mouth, too. <laughs> yeah. If I was given the opportunity back yeah. in 1962 or whenever that happened, the first interracial kiss. 50 like, years ago. Gene, oh, absolutely. Gene, I know Nichelle. I'm your man, baby. Oh, you I know, know her? her, yeah. Very Have well. You kissed her? Very well. I, on the cheek. She's All kissed right. me on the cheek. Nice. All right. Yeah, nice. I got some good pictures on Facebook of, uh, of us hugging. Yeah. If you want right. to check them out. Well, Michelle and I became good friends uh, from all of the work that I did for Paramount. And speaking of the conventions, John. My, she's still smoking hot, too. I just want she to say is. those words. She is. She's an amazing lady. I'm not sure how old she is, and I wouldn't ask because I don't ask a lady her age. But you know what? Still smoking hot. Yeah, absolutely. The show's been on 50 years, so she must be like 27. Yep. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 27. Right. Yeah. And she's a very kind and generous person, too. I bet. Really I bet. nice lady. I hung out at these conventions a lot because that's uh, I had a, an art distributor there that sold my work at the conventions. And most of my, most of my work um, was being sold at those conventions. Wow. And Well, that's where your audience that's is. That's a good place yeah. to sell it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You'd be surprised at the kinds of people that go to these. We're talking doctors, lawyers, physicists, every well, profession. Well, there are, there are the imagine. young comic book nerd fans. Absolutely. Sure. But, but but you expect those, right? Yeah. yeah right. You don't expect these people that are doctors and lawyers dressed right. up in outfits. and Well, all doctors that. and lawyers liked comic books when they were growing up, too. Sure. And now that that show is 50 years old, right. you know, the folks who have grown up with the show and who got it when they yes, were young they got it are going to be the folks who have an evolved position older in their life mm-hmm. and also the disposable income by the way to come up with a klingon costume <laughs> hey i'm going to be a klingon for four days in las vegas you can't half step that yeah i mean you can if you want nobody's gonna uh, they will they'll welcome you with open arms but there are people down there with thousands of Seriously. dollars worth yeah. of, you know, prosthetics and shit. Not to mention the stuff they're buying at these conventions, collectibles yeah. right. and, and yeah. my artwork. It was it yeah. was crazy. Yeah. Right. It was crazy how passionate they are for this stuff. They get it. But I'll tell you what I enjoyed about that convention was it and it wasn't just Star Trek, although that was it was the Star Trek convention, so it was dominated by the Star Trek world. But they also had, uh, there were people. I met the guy who was in the robot suit. Nice. In Lost in Space. Yes. Oh, yeah. And that guy was, mm-hmm. yeah. I, I know him. Uh-huh. And, well, he passed away recently, yeah, right. but he and I were friends. Oh, Bob sorry. May. Yeah. Uh, Bob May. Yes. I'm sorry to hear that he passed away because I tell some good stories about him, and some of them are a little cheeky. And because uh, he, was, he, was, uh, he was a character. 
Yeah, he was. He's a nice man, too. Really a nice man. I smoked cigarettes back then, and so did he. In the suit. So what we would do <laughs> yeah, is, yes. uh, you know, we would find ourselves on smoke breaks. And that's how I got to know him, because I was like, hey, Bob, you want to catch a smoke? Yeah, yeah. And then he'd go back, and we, he'd t- start talking about these stories. Like, he would, he would open a story with, okay, I was with, and he'd name three or four people that, it, since that's not my world, I don't know who they are. And I was with these guys, and we were on this cruise, right? And it was us, and there were about four or five other celebrities. And I'm thinking to myself, did you just use the word celebrity, man? Your fa- you were in a suit. Yeah. Nobody ever saw you, Bob. But, of course, I wouldn't say that to him. But it just would blow my mind that he really was in this world where everybody, you never saw his face on screen. Right. But everybody knew who he was. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, he had a huge following. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, People would buy his pictures with his autograph all the time at these conventions. Hey, do guys like him and Anthony Daniels, do they have like their own little fraternity, like where they get together? <laughs> Wouldn't you? <laughs> I would. I mean, the, the man in the, the suit. I'm the guy yeah. in the suit. Yeah, fraternity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, who's this guy? Hey, no, he's with me, man. He's all yeah. right. Yeah, but he can't be here. No, seriously, he was Ultraman. Yeah. You know, something like that. <laughs> but Anthony Daniels, though, at least you got to hear his voice, right? Yeah. Right. Bob yeah. May, you didn't get even hear, you didn't his, even hear voice. his voice. Well, no. But the guy he who just... played H.R. Puff and stuff. Like, oh. that guy just jumped around with a giant hamburger their, on his head. Their job really was just to make this suit ambulatory. Right. It's like, you got to get it from this mark to this mark. <laughs> and don't catch on fire. And try and emote from yeah. inside that box. Right. I need well, to go he back did. To he but, did. He made those arms but move in such what? a way. He. Yes, and we think about that, and we understand exactly what that was. Mm -hmm. So, oh, man, God bless him. You know, I'm sorry to hear that he passed. He was a funny guy. Yes, and unfortunately, he lost his home in one of those big fires in Southern Mm. California just prior to that. And I think that partly contributed to his demise. He he, he broke his heart because he lost all of his collectibles and all his memorabilia from his days in Lost in Space. Sure, yeah. Well, that'd be rough. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah, that's terrible. His whole life was that. I, I bet, yeah. I mean, that was his whole life. B9 robot. Mm-hmm. Let us move back to uh, Seven of Nine. Cause <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Bob, for your contributions to our entertainment past. And well, I wanted to ask. such a great guy. But so I, I've done some work at One Letterman uh, in San Francisco, out in the Presidio. And that's where LucasArts has an office. Oh, yeah. And there's a ton of art there. Is any of your art there? Because I've seen all that stuff. Well, I, I know that one of my images, which was turned into a print, it's it's called Death Star Rising. It's in ILM somewhere. Okay. So uh, I think it's hanging somewhere there. Yeah, it could be. Could George be. Lucas sent, a, sent me a letter thanking me for the for the yeah. art. So This and is I, incredible art. In it book. is. It, it, well, this, you mean that at the Presidio? Yes. Yeah. yeah. No. Oh, yeah, the best of the best. Yeah. These guys are the Imagineers for sure. Right. So let's talk about what drives uh, your inspiration to make these things because you're a uh, fucking wildly interesting dude, man. Well, <laughs> well thanks, uh, John. I appreciate that, that description. Uh, I take that as a compliment. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I, I guess I'm just like anybody it, on this human journey trying to just – figure out you know what is the meaning and purpose of life but also what is my potential as a as a human being what can i do with what i've been given i want to explore that and i'm really inspired by aesthetics yeah i'm inspired by excellence things things that are just i guess inspiring you know you can look at a shape or a form or a color, and it does something to you emotionally. We're wired, right, right, to respond to these things. And so ever since I was a kid, I grew up on all this stuff that excited me. I wanted to express it somehow through my art. I wanted When I saw something on a TV show, I wanted to draw it. And yeah. so I wanted to say, how good can I draw this? And, you know, life is full of surprises. Think, if you – here's the thing I've learned about life, at least for me, and it's, it's inexplicable – and why I also kind of moved heavy into not just uh, – I'm really into metaphysics now too because I want to understand to what degree am I having an influence on my reality. But I find that where you point your conscious intention, mm-hmm. whether or not you want to say it's 
luck, coincidence, or or you you believe in a higher power, your prayers are being answered, whatever, right? It 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 actually affects how your life unfolds, and of course you have to back it up with action, right? Sure. But what I notice is where I point my intention, it's like things just inexplicably open up to me, as long as I'm doing the hard work, right? But I think it's more than just doing the hard work. I don't think it's just like cause and effect. I think it's something more. I think we actually have an effect on our lives that is uh, unexplainable. I mean, look at like, for example, the placebo effect, right? I mean, you, we know for a fact, and this is not it's yeah, a debatable. Real thing. It exists. Yeah. yeah, we yeah. know that if I take the sugar pill, but I believe it's a real pill, my body changes, things I can actually heal from, our symptoms can go away. Right. To what? De- where's the boundary of that? Right. To yeah. what degree do it? Does it stop having an effect on the reality? And so, that's part of what inspires me. Is I want to pursue excellence. I want to do things that excite me, and I also want to, through my art, convey what I'm excited about to others. And so in a way, I guess it's kind of like proselytizing, you know, in some fashion about something more. You know, what, so. what does excite you, though? Like, if you could capture that. Boy, geez, that's a that's a big question because there's so many things that excite me. Uh, I, I'm sure like all of you guys, you know, you, you're excited. You have a diverse interest, right? And it's not just one thing. And sometimes it's contextual. Like one moment you're excited because you're in this certain circumstance. Another minute... Wow, this excites me. I just have this insatiable need to always create something, content. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sure. <laughs> and I, I, maybe we're all just wired as human beings to create. I think that's partly true for all of us, right? We all want to create. You guys are creating this radio show. Right. Why is it that you want to create this radio show? You want to somehow convey these interesting ideas, uh, what you think um, – are interesting people and and you guys are interesting because you're interested in other people so all that collectively is going out and it's inspiring other people because they're interested in what people are doing because we're all just kind of figuring this out right what are we here for trying to figure it out yeah and so you know through this radio show i'm I'm sure that people get some of that and so that's what inspires me basically kind of a long-winded answer but no it's a great answer and you keep talking about things and it's evolved it's a it's a wise it's an educated look at things. You're not you centric. You're not egocentric. You're trying to figure out how to contribute, how to obviously, you know, affect your own outcome by having this positive uh, way of pointing at things. It's partly pragmatic. I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, you've got to survive, right? But but you're, you've got a very healthy respect for how little that requires of you. And then also by, if you give out things come back. Yes. You know, if you're sending out these positive things it, by karma. Yeah. By, by putting someone's, uh, uh, you know, answering the, like when they see your art and they're mm-hmm. like, I, I'm a huge star Trek fan and I need this thing. Every time they walk by that thing, you've done a little something, you know, towards their heart, which so, I honor and greatly appreciate. I never take it for granted because I, first of all, I feel lucky that I, you know, have the ability to, to do anything right. with art, but I also, understand that we're all trying to just make the best of what attributes, circumstances we're given to do something special in this life. Sure. And so if somebody comes up and wants to talk to me about my art or they want to give me a compliment or something, it's like I just feel really honored that I can actually even um, get that from someone. John and Pete. Hey, everybody. If you like the Break It Down show. I can dig it. And of course you do. Of course you do. Hit that subscribe button. John and Pete. It helps us out. Hey, if you're going to like the show on Facebook or on Twitter, it helps us out if you share the show so people can learn about it. So liking it is great. Sharing is even better. Let's do some spy stuff. Yeah. Just Let's get all our friends' phones and have them subscribe to the Break It Down show. Do it. Subscribe. Listen to the show. If you love the show, tell five of your friends. Or if you hate the show... Tell five of your friends. I'm a big fan of Shep Gordon. Everybody uh, has gone wild over Shep Gordon. He's Come been on the, the show, Shep. Business. <laughs> yeah. He's been in the entertainment business for a long, long time. But he's sort of newly famous because there was a documentary about him on Netflix recently that Michael Myers made called Supermensch. And it's great. If you guys haven't seen it, you should see it. It's uh, great. I've seen it. 
a lot of his theme is I'm not a practicing Buddhist. I'm not a practicing, even though he's hangs out with the Dalai Lama has cooked for him several times, things like that. But he's like, Hey man, I just live my life in service of others. And I've been fortunate enough that that has given me the wealth to do whatever I want. And so I feel like the, whatever I want has to continue to be gaining my satisfaction from being in service of others. Mm -hmm. And like you said, it's uh, something that it feeds feeds the universe, but it feeds you back. I, I think there's something intrinsic and fundamental about that. I, I believe that deep down, fundamentally, we are all connected on some level. Yeah. And even quantum physics proves that that we live in kind of a of a, a holistic holographic reality in, in a way. But I think just as a humanity that we understand that I think what gets in the way is not only egos, but the circumstances in which we find ourselves and the construct that we're living in, which forces us to have to survive dog eat dog, whatever you want to call that. Mm -hmm. Right. doesn't always bring out the best in humanity. And so, and especially in a, in a, in a, a world that is focused so heavily on commercialization, materialism, yeah. we, we tend to be kind of like, program to think that our value and self-worth comes from things yeah but ultimately comes from our relationships right for sure it's like when, when it gets right down to it and you're on your deathbed and you've heard the saying oh i wish people never say i wish i spent more time at the office it's like you know yeah. it's like you wish that you spent more time with your loved ones Right. So it's like and, that old commercial when the kids, like the little kids, are talking about what they're going to be, and one kid's like, "I want to claw my way up to middle manager." <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's that that's right. classic. Yeah. That's yeah. classic. But and to bring it back to, to like quantum physics that I just mentioned earlier, here's the interesting thing about light. Okay, we we know that light, and this has been proven by science. It's so the guy I'm who not, paints on glass, everybody. Right. Yeah, he knows about light. <laughs> Tell us the interesting thing about light. Well, here's the thing about light. Light, whenever we look at a star and we go, wow, that light, light took, let's say that star is supposedly 4.3 light years away. Yeah. That light took 4.3 years to get to me, right? Well, that's from our human perspective. But did you know that from light's perspective, it's already been here? And it's been here all along. And that for light, time stands still. Right. And there is no distance between points. It's everywhere all at once. And that's a paradox. Yeah. We can't reconcile that from the human perspective. But if you understand that from light's perspective, and Einstein said this, that everything is just made of energy, right? He proved right. it in E equals MC squared. Everything in some fashion is made from light. So on a fundamental level, light is interconnected to all points in space-time. So are we. So on a quantum level, we're all connected. But we don't experience it that way. And then we've been taught pretty much to focus on the external. Right. But when you really get down to the heart, matters of the heart, all that sort of stuff, I think we intrinsically understand that we're all connected. But this is what makes you interesting to me is, is you've got time to reflect on these things. And it's sort of your mission in life is to create these kinds of images, I would imagine. Like this stuff informs your art. There's folks that for commercialism for them is survival. You know, and you give them. Well, it was for me too, though. Sure, right, to a degree, for sure. Maybe they don't have this; haven't figured out their out their outlet for that kind of thing, and so they're they're doing something, they're sacrificing to get to a different space. But you give them this instance, this time, this collection of light and, and color that allows them to see something else, and I think that that's beautiful because not everybody has has your ability to be this amplifier for things. I mean, you can talk about action or spooky action at a distance probably and tell me what it means to my soul i just know that exists and and i've got to go now and kind of go make some money so i can pay my rent you know well, well i'm subject to these same things too like everybody else i th this this kind of existential exploration this uh, metaphysical thing for me <sighs> actually occurred probably within the last eight years i wasn't like this you know during my whole art career mm -hmm. in fact i was more interested in astronomy star trek and all that I would say, of course, because I like the aesthetic beauty of it and, and I wanted to inspire, but it was it was more superficial. But I think as you get older, you can't help but start asking these deep questions. Yeah, what's the meaning and purpose of all of this stuff and how it's all related? Then you connect it back up to what you're doing. Sure. 
and then you can kind of convey it to people, you know, that you discover. You can't help but want to share what you discovered about these things because right. it's exciting stuff. That's pretty much where I'm at right now with my art. What I got out of that was uh, Amanda Pete and I are already connected. There you go. That's that's what I extracted you guys are from riding on a beam of light together. Yes, we are. <laughs> Did you hear that, Amanda? <laughs> anyway, no. In all seriousness, I think that when you can grasp an artist's message and maturity in a medium that's unique, like paint on glass, maybe that's what lit people up about you to throw a pun in. Because I can see where somebody would not quite understand what they're looking at, aside from the aesthetic quality that is enduring about the images that you painted. But the transparency of the glass, the way that the paint allows for light to wake it up, is something that I think we perceive in ways that aren't just through our eyeballs. I think that because of that, we're able to see something and just... You know, something inside of us is ignited. Mm -hmm. And we talked earlier over dinner about the way that human beings perceive things and that this is, in a lot of ways, a virtual reality. I mean, even the things that we take as reality, which is the way that light bounces off of stuff and the way that we digest it through cones and rods in our eyes and, and all of that stuff. I mean, it is just... Perception. It's not like a matrix thing, like we're being fed. But to some degree, we Through have to senses. acknowledge that our our senses are a thing that is you interpreting. Know. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that's that's a great, great analogy, metaphor. I mean, explanation of the human experience. I I think that what's interesting right now, as these scientists today are trying to assess what the nature of reality is is that you're seeing more and more in the mainstream people like Elon Musk mm -hmm. that if you you can YouTube this, you can look it up, but he was on stage and asked the question about his interest in virtual reality, and he his answer was, it's a billion to one that we're not living, that, I mean, it's a billion to one that we are living in a virtual reality. Now, of course, people on at first blush, they go, oh, that doesn't make any sense. How can that be? Right. But when you really understand quantum physics and you understand that the conflicts that exist between one branch of science, which is called relativistic physics and uh, quantum physics, they can't be reconciled. The only explanation that seems to reconcile everything is by assigning everything to the paradigm of a virtual reality. And when you understand how the universe works and you realize it's an information networking system, that it's all just based on information, then you can start to go, wow, you know, Maybe what we think this is isn't what it really is. It's just a human experience. You're just it, you're interpreting your experience through your five senses, but we're next to blind, right? Really, if you look at the spectrum of our eyesight, sure. our uh, auditory functions, all of that sort of stuff, it's a very just a slit. Every and one of our senses, every one of our senses, is so finite, absolutely, in its ability to perceive. And and get this, even secular science will admit that. What they can actually detect and visualize in the entire universe is only 4%. Right. Yeah. Yet they, on the other hand, will say, well, we, have a, we think we know what's going on. Yeah. Well, no, they don't. They're admitting they don't. And so they assign it to these really esoteric things like, well, the remaining 96% is dark matter dark and dark matter. energy, right? Yeah. They don't even know what that is. Yeah. Yet they know we're next to blind. We're right. looking through a little sliver, a keyhole. That time you woke up in the car and I was feeling you up, Pete. I wasn't really feeling you up. Is that dark matter? No, was, that's right. That's what dark that was. Dark matter. And I'm dark, so it doesn't matter. It was dark meat. Good Lord. Uh, Good Lord indeed. So what's, uh, what's next on the horizon, man? What are you working on besides uh, – well, no, let's talk actually in more detail about Lewin and Thank you. The graphic novel and the – because I've seen it. And it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. It's – uh, the level of detail, the storyline, her backstory, her just what makes her tick and how goddamn vicious she is. <laughs> She's, you know what she is? I'm pretty sure, first of all, that, you know, it's a graphic novel and it's Michael. So, you know, he draws her in a way that's, let's just say, uh, she's sexy. Uh, man. Yeah. She's damn sexy. She's sexy. I'm pretty sure she plays the bass. <laughs> you know what I mean? And in, in, in her off hours, that's yeah. what she's doing. She plays the bass and she's funky as hell. 
Are there any? And you know how I feel about chicks who play the best. Are there any <laughs> frumpy <laughs> heroines in the graphic novel novel world? No, they're not uh, frumpy. Boy, not frumpy. that'd be hard hard it, pressed to find like, a frumpy heroine <laughs> in the yeah. graphic. It's like <laughs> it's like frumpy. a it'd be like a sweater. frumpy chick on the side of a lowrider. Okay. <laughs> that that yeah. doesn't exist. A frumpy blessed Virgin Mary. Yeah, um, yeah. Here's the Aztec warrior. He's got a bit of a paunch. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit of a beer belly. I got this long sweater. It makes me comfortable. I was cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's I've come to whip your ass. <laughs> She's got swords. Yeah, she plays the bass. Where's leather? She's got boots. She wears leather for sure. Rides a motorcycle. Right. She a rides a she motorcycle. Went, a skeleton motorcycle. Yeah, a skeleton by the way. motorcycle with skulls for treads on the tires. There you go. And you recognize that when you saw that. Yeah, I, I like that. That was cool. So. Um, the novel itself, though, you've got a number of things that are branching off of it already. Yes. I, well, I how this started was I wrote one issue that was the backstory of Louine's mother and parents, and then I realized that that was kind of a misstep in, in my strategy for telling her story. I realized that I should probably just jump right into her contemporary story and just throw you right into the action. So I... I I'm close to completing that issue right now. I'm probably four or five pages away. The problem with writing a graphic novel when you're doing it by yourself, it takes forever because most comic books are done by four or five people. You've got a penciler, uh, inker, you've right. got a, yeah. a dialogue person, you've got a god, the colorist. It's just crazy. That's why they call them bullpens. If mm. you look at Marvel, they have their bullpens. And so anyway... You know, like and you got ha- Michael. He's doing all this shit and philosophizing. Uh, yeah. Well, I, that's just me trying to figure out. You know, why am I experiencing existential angst? So I have right. to figure that out while I'm working on this thing. But yeah. it is part of the storyline. Actually, she is a what I call a Ronin witch, and the reason I call her a Ronin witch, we most of us know that are familiar with samurai lore. A Ronin is a samurai without a master. Right. So she practices. She's a practicing martial artist who subscribes to the Bushido Code, the way of the, the, the samurai. She's a practicing martial artist mm-hmm. in a graphic novel who, who practices the Bushido Code. You know what that means? She got a big booty. She, got a big booty. she don't take no shit. Exactly. Yeah. And she right does on. shots. Yeah. She rides a Harley with skulls for training. She trade. does. Exactly. She does shots. <laughs> and if you say something about it, she yeah. got a couple of weapons you don't see. Right. There's plenty of weapons you do see. Oh, yeah. So she's also a witch. I say she's a Ronin witch. Well, she's a witch, and why it really works well by calling her a Ronin witch, she's a witch without a coven. So she belongs to no coven. No master, yeah. No master again. So that's Louine, and uh, I just was on the phone with my publisher today, who's also my agent. She has a publishing company as well. We're coming out with a coloring book first quarter of next year to kind of launch Louine. That's going to be concurrent with hopefully the completion of the, the first issue of the comic book, but... Interesting thing about coloring books, when you hear about it at first, you go, oh, a coloring book. But coloring books are huge, huge in right bookstore, yeah. adult coloring books. Yeah. Right. They're everywhere, and it's a multi-billion dollar business. This is a motherfucker of a coloring book, too. I mean, it's yeah. so intricate and so detailed and so interesting in its ability to allow you to express so much. Exactly. Brenda loves coloring. If she gets so into it, she forgets to breathe. Yeah. Like she's so focused, like other stuff to stop. People get obsessed with it. Yeah. You know what it is, though? It's because we all want to create, right? Right. So when you, it's people are vicariously. Christy loves color. Becoming, they're like, they're they're being their own artist by, you know, doing their own interpretation. Because this is going to be purple, you know? Exactly. Yeah. I love, I I love it. And if you look at the bookstores, I was just in a bookstore yesterday doing a little bit of a exploratory work to see what's out there. They got, Coloring books for Lord of the Rings, coloring books for Harry Potter, coloring books for every single entertainment property, Game of Thrones. They got all their own coloring books. It's crazy. So I'm, I'm excited that Lewin will be part of that yeah, pantheon. Cool. Lewin plays a purple sunburst. <laughs> P base. 1959. Uh-huh. Uh huh. 59 to 62 P base. Right. <laughs> You got her figured out. But a guy she named does. Earl, she bought it from that guy. <laughs> well, that guy was, you know what? Yeah. I don't know if she bought it from Earl, oh, she but she's it? she he works on it. Nice. Like he's adjusted the truss rod for, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know, she's a performance. Yeah. Uh, she had to help me write this story. He fiddled with the nut. Because the nut he wasn't fiddled right. with the nut on Wow. Right. You know, because I actually have her practicing on some musical instruments. Yeah. You know, I might need to have you consult for me. She can practice on a lot of things, but yeah. in, in her heart, she's a bass player. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, she does actually play a cello. That is a bass yeah. instrument, right? Sure. So, yeah. I mean, Good it is enough. a bass. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> Why does she play the cello? You know, I, I like it's because I like the cello. Okay. And How it's do pretty these much things that, come to you? I mean, like a motorcycle with skulls for treads, a skeleton motorcycle. Like, is that just is like it, when, when you're you, talking about you know cool Aztec chicks on a van? It's like I don't know. It's it's like it just it's cool, right? It, it's almost like it's supposed to be. Yeah, you have a thing, and then you're already in your mind. You've already perceived it and filled it out, and now it's just a matter of allowing it to materialize. And uh, I think that's the thing about this character is that you know we're already going into our own interpretations yes. about her and we're explaining you're her. helping actually bring her to more life by right. just talking about this see yeah. this is that conscious intention that's like you know reverberating out in the universe you're going to help on make this actually a material reality right I'm well, thank you guys for that peak. see oh, this is the thing is that i'm a drummer so a drummer will make a wise crack and then look over, like the band is just the getting there, especially if you're just like, hey, man, I got hired to do this gig. Of course, I can come do this gig. And you get there and you don't know everybody. You just know the you just know the piano player because you gigged with him before and he knows you can get the job done. So he calls you in. So you get there and you're back there setting up your stuff and everybody's kind of setting up and you make a wisecrack and you look over and you realize that the chick you sort of didn't make the wisecrack necessarily about, but you just kind of lobbed it in that direction. And what she's unpacking is a bass. You go, oh, shit. <laughs> you know, I'm going to keep my mouth shut until she says something else because I don't know what's going to happen. I don't want that bitch to knock me out. <laughs> that happens. That happens. You know, it's different if you go, oh, yeah, she's, you know, whatever. But there are two instruments that a woman plays that tells you, you better not play with this girl. And they are the bass and the trombone. When you see a woman mm. play the trombone, because girls don't play the trombone out of the fourth grade unless they have something in their DNA <laughs> that says, I'm taking smack from exactly nobody. <laughs> what and if a girl she, plays the tuba? I'd lump tuba in there. Okay. I'd lump tuba in there <laughs> because choice? they got to hump that thing home. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's that builds the – she's got some there, developed lats. Concert tuba. There's some she's force of will thing. there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> force of will. That's a, that's a chick that goes, fuck it. Yep. <laughs> I'm going to do this. You, know? you heard me. Yeah. That's exactly. what she says. Yep. Like, but you're in the seventh grade. You can't say those words. And they get the bird. Hey, no, GPS. we know somebody whose daughter plays a sousaphone. Who? I don't remember. Oh, man. I don't know. You know, I think it's something about the fact it's somebody that we know, though. Okay, we think girls they're supposed to be diminutive or whatever, right? Yeah. Petite. You know, they aren't supposed to be wrestling big instruments. So, just the fact that they are, right, right. Because here's the the next thing that happens is the dude unpacks unpacks the clarinet. Yeah, <laughs> and the chick who plays the tuba looks at that dude and goes, "Yeah, that's what you brought." You okay. play the piccolo. <laughs> So, oh, soprano player, huh? Yeah. Okay, great. So that's not bringing bringing it all, right? Yeah, not a cut on Branford Marsalis, by the <laughs> yeah, way, yeah, yeah. or anybody who plays the whistle. From or... his from his standpoint, it was like, no, nah, man, I'm secure enough to play the soprano. Yes. That's why I bring it. So there that's, you go. That's for him. But for the most of the fifth graders who are unpacking their instrument, when you see that girl, and she's got like a large brass instrument or she plays the cello or some something that's got some, you know, some oomph. mass. Yeah, some mass and some oomph. <laughs> you know, she's like a force to be reckoned with. Absolutely. So if we've Absolutely. done anything to help explain this character in our heads, I mean, I, and I'm making this up because I didn't see her playing a, a purple 62P bass, but now I do. Absolutely. You and brought it into reality. Like it's it. there now. Yeah. And and we may never see that, but that's my understanding of her. You're inspiring me, though. All right. Yeah, She's absolutely. She's got a big callus on her thumb. Uh-huh. <laughs> She'll rub that in your eye. You she around, will. You, know? you mess around. Yeah. You get you get the callus. <laughs> so, yeah. Shout out to Tall Wilkenfeld. Tall Wilkenfeld. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She's a bass player. She's like, I don't know how old she is. She's not old. Yeah. yeah. But when she was like 16, she was playing with Herbie Hancock. Wow. Bass player. Holy cow. And it's not like, and she's adorable. This girl is cute. And she puts on the bass and she will fuck you up. <laughs> she's not kidding. She is she cutting will. heads. Wow. In a ridiculous way that makes big dude bass players like James Early go, oh boy. Damn. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So anyway, that's Louine. 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 Well, 
she is being shopped around also as a entertainment property to the studios in in, in the form of pitches. So nice. that's I'm happening. already in my head thinking about who's going to play her. I want to see her okay. as a live action feature length movie. That's the yeah. goal. In the in the vein of things like Underworld. Yeah. Remember that movie? Yeah, sure. Ass kicking vampire. Right. She's not a vampire, but she's a witch. Yeah. But basically kicking some demon ass. So so who plays her? I love this game. Mm-hmm. It's a good okay, game. Okay, she's half. She's she's part Japanese and, and a little bit of Chinese, but she's the other side of her is Scottish and Irish. And and, and that's because I'm half Japanese right. and the other half is Scottish Irish. Okay. Samurai and Highlander. Nice. So let Mash me, up. Let me say if if we were in nineteen ninety one, oh come on. She would All have right. been played by Nia Peoples. Could be. Moving Could forward be. forward uh-huh. slightly. She would have well, background laughing. cheer. Yeah. Well, she would <laughs> KB's reading a book about insomnia and laughing her ass off. <laughs> it does always yeah, I, does I knew always. it was coming too. I'm like, this is gonna be near people's I know I, I know where it's coming next. Go ahead. Okay. It's going to end at Jessica Alba. Okay. Good. But the thing could is, have been too. It could, yeah, it could have been if it was younger, six years ago. Younger. It would have been. Mm-hmm. It would have been Jessica Alba. It might be. Uh, I don't know who it is now. I'm I, just I too old and fat to know who that this generation's <laughs> yeah, Jessica you Alba throw, Nia uh, people. You can is. throw me in there as well. Yeah. Uh, I don't know who would be uh, a good young seventeen, eighteen year old half Asian. Half. Yeah, she hasn't emerged yet. Not yet. I'm. Lo- I'm looking though. I got my so eyes. So we're going for an unknown. Mm-hmm. But the thing I would, is, you in know a what? way, I would You're, prefer an unknown. Yeah. Okay. It, mm-hmm. it, she almost has to be because she has to come without notions that are, you know, she either has to be an unknown or she has to come from, let's say, like she was a, a UFC lightweight who just decided, I'm too fine to do this anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like I want a belt. I'm like 18 and one, but I don't want to be 18 and two. So. Right. Yeah, well, I'm gonna go get me some real money because I deserve it. Yeah, is she more Nordic? Is she like a you know a bigger girl or is she? Uh, no, more... she's petite. She's petite. Okay, mm-hmm. okay. And that is that's what makes the fact that she rides. Not only does she ride a motorcycle, mm-hmm. but she rides like a, a a rigid. Oh wow! It's a rigid. Yeah, it's a hard tail. And she is, <laughs> and, <laughs> and she's kickstarting that bad boy. Exactly. Like, no electric you start is on this little thing. girl who has to like grab the handlebar right. on one side and almost run up the bike and jump down on exactly. the starter. And if it throws off wrong, she's going to have to do a backflip. A little of recoil thing. off the kickstarter. Yeah. Is, is, is her grandpa Randall Tex Cobb from Raising Arizona? It might be. <laughs> But nowadays, the thing I love about that character is that that is today's character. I mean, more and more as we uh, get into the – I mean, let's face it. I'm How old are you, man? Like 36? So, uh, uh, Yeah, I wish. Right, right around <laughs> How many there years ago? <laughs> right around 36. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, when we were kids, a mix of two Asian cultures and Scottish and Irish all put together was – uh, less common than it is now. Absolutely. And so now, uh, I think that the emergence of that movie star, whoever she is out there, um, you know, keep practicing whoever you are. Because whoever it is, is right now she's practicing. You know, she's... She's out there. Hitting the speed bag. Mm-hmm. She's got her dad's holding pads for her, and she's she's training. She's a, she, I see her as a modern-day heroine. And we all love empowered females that sure. kick ass, right? There's there's something to that. Absolutely. Yep. And I I think that for sure she's going to have some kind of a background like that because I think it would really add to the role. Mm-hmm. And I love the fact that she's petite dealing with all of this big stuff, big bikes, big evil, big darkness. Right. Nah. Big bikes, big evil, big darkness. <laughs> That's why as much as I love Gina Carano, She's mm-hmm. got too much in the shoulders okay. to play this part. Okay. Yeah, she's pretty big. She looks like, yeah, you can handle that bike. Well, mm-hmm. she actually has to fight people. Right. You know, and and yeah. she's probably too old, too. So, Well, yeah, by yeah. like 15 years. Yeah, exactly. So Awesome, but yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. right now we're talking about an entertainment property whose star is right now probably 15. Very possibly. You know. That's if I can get this thing sold in the near future. Well, I got to hurry, gotta hurry up. You need Shep Gordon. Oof. It's not easy getting a property sold in Hollywood. I bet. Give you a little background. I, I actually had a couple of things optioned by the studios. One was a project that's still alive 
it was being shopped to Paramount and they, I was in negotiations with them and who wanted to produce it at the time was Kathleen Kennedy and Frank Marshall. Okay. Anybody who's familiar with Kathleen Kennedy knows that she's basically in charge of all of Star Wars right, right. now. A huge producer for Spielberg. I was sitting across the table just like this one here with uh, Frank Marshall and her wanting to produce this other project. But when I went into negotiations with Paramount, the whole thing fell apart because they tend to want to control your property. Mm. They want to give you a net deal oftentimes, which right. means that you don't want to see anything. Right. Some parts of me wish I would have done it. Just maybe it was a, could have been a lost leader and they could have led to other things. But it's really hard to make a deal with Hollywood. Yeah. And so I think the way I'm doing it now is I'm trying to build it from the grassroots, build market equity through sure. through my own comic book and then also merchandise. Yeah. And if you can build market equity, then you can come at the studios with a lot more leverage. You know the movie that made – Arnold Schwarzenegger, his most money was Twins. Oh, so mainstream, right? Right. Yes, it was so commercial. And nobody saw it coming. Yeah. So they no. were like, yeah, you what? You want a bigger piece of that pie? Sure. Yeah. You know, we'll take a bigger piece of Conan. Right. Uh, and we'll give you a bigger piece of Twins. That so was savvy on his part. It right. really was. Yeah. But in case anybody isn't aware of Kathleen Kennedy, here's uh, what it means to sit across the table and talk about your property with Kathleen Kennedy. She was a co-founder of Amblin Entertainment. And uh, one thing that I'm looking at her Wikipedia page right now, um, she is third only to Steven Spielberg and Stan Lee in domestic box office receipts. Holy shit. We're talking about a chick who probably plays the bass. <laughs> <laughs> nice circle back there. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. She's she's big time. She's, she's a heavy hitter. She's a heavy hitter. And the and property. If you want to know where her producing credits came from, you can start at ET. Yeah. There you go. She Absolutely. Together she's not a stranger yeah. to the putting together of a movie. Her yeah. husband, Frank Marshall, directed Arachnophobia. Right. Directed, I believe, the movie was called Alive about those uh, surviving soccer team mm -hmm. up in the Andes yeah. as uh, swing kids. Sure. Okay. You've been behind some really successful movies they were both really wonderful people um the project i was negotiating with and that they wanted to produce was called shred uh -huh. and that was another project that i i'm working on right now and it it's it's been 15 years in the making right but shred stands for super humanoids for reconnaissance espionage and defense nice kind of like chud <laughs> <laughs> right yes <laughs> You talked about Frank Marshall's directing credits, and you, the, you're talking about the movie in the uh, with the soccer players who had, were in the plane crash, had to eat right. each other. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. That was a heavy movie. Yeah. Really well done. Yeah. That was a heavy movie with some really amazing uh, directing, general filmmaking, physical obstacles. Yes. Absolutely. To making that movie. Yeah. And here you are, you know, focused really in about one location and yeah. all the dynamics going on just amongst a, a, a social group of people trying to survive. Right. That takes some imagination to make that interesting. Sure. Of course, the circumstances made it interesting, but just the interaction of all these people under that stress. Yeah. Oh, my God. And then ultimately con being confronted by the fact that the only way we're going to survive is this to is eat right. somebody. You're right. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Shoof. And then to be the one guys, of my teammates to be the guys that go walk down a mountain with no oh. trail, nothing, you know? Oh. Yeah. That was do or die. Right. Yep. Right. It's like, well, it's do and usually die. Ex exactly. I mean, Eddie went, didn't come back. You know, there's all kinds of those stories. Absolutely. That guy goes to rescue and they just, Whew. you know? Yeah. Well, thankfully most of us have not been confronted with that challenge. <laughs> In case anybody didn't hear, Pete said, Eddie went, he did. He did. Eddie would go, and he did go, and he didn't make it back. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So, great, man. What should we look for next out of you, and where should we be keeping our eyeballs? If we're the audience and we're hearing uh, something interesting in what you're doing, what, what do you want people to look at? Probably, I think the best way to stay abreast with what I'm doing is through my Facebook page, Michael David Ward, if you just do a search on that. I use my Facebook page mostly for my art. It's not so much my, my personal life. 
So it's a good way to see what I'm working on. And I also have websites, michaeldavidward.com and lewine.com. Those are some of the things they can check out. Spell Lewin for us. Lewin is spelled L-O-W-E-E-N, and it's derived from the word Halloween. And, and it's one like of the re- Halloween without Hal. Exactly. You can say, or, hi, Lewin, Halloween. The reason I came up with this is that one of the things I liked when I was younger is I loved watching this old cult B movie actress called Vampira. Anybody uh-huh. familiar with her? Uh-huh. Now she was in the fifties, and she was the groundbreaking vampire heroine that came on as kind of a host for these like low budget movies. Right. And she was the precursor to some of the hosts like Bob Wilkins of Creature Features and right. all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And then she ultimately inspired Elvira. Right. And I've always liked those characters. And I thought because Halloween is actually my favorite holiday. Sure. I love Halloween. <laughs> I love all the movies around it. I thought, well, you know, I think it's time that there be a new kind of queen of Halloween. So you can find her there by just checking out some of those sites. What's Halloween's walk-up song? Boy, I haven't, you know, I haven't thought of that yet. Uh, There are songs that I actually uh, associated with her, but not really (laughs) that. Well, you got some in mind? Yeah. You got some in mind? Let's go. Come on, man. Man, you know, you can always, you can't go wrong with Rage Against the Machine. So no. it just builds. Yeah. You know, yeah. And yeah. Down, 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 you're like, oh shit, something about to happen. It's got to be, it's got to be edgy for sure. Sure. It's got to yeah. have edge. It's got to be, there's, there's so much good music out there right now. Oh, of course. Yeah. I mean, all these mashups and fusions going on, right? Yes. Really just cool, inspiring stuff. Whatever it is, is going to be something by uh, Skrillex and it's going to okay. be inspired by Inner Sandman. Nice. Mm. So yeah, it's gonna mm. have the the you know there's yeah. there's gonna be something kind of laid back about it because she's got a swagger to her, and then when she gets up there is when it bursts open and she starts fucking it up. There's certain instruments that bring that kind of feeling of in, in, impending doom. You exactly. Know, like something about to happen. Like a, yeah. Like a, a berry sax, you know that thing's just. Uh-huh. Like, oh God, a berry sa- a berry sax through an overdrive pedal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> something, something terrifying like yeah. that. Maybe it's a really dirty and scary version of going back to Cali. Mm-hmm. Ooh, there you, you know? go. There you and go. It's just terrifying. Well, let's hope that she comes out in the near future, so we can uh, have that uh, premiere party. You know, yes, It'd be a blast, right? Right. The Halloween party. And let's hope Pete doesn't dress like her. Because oh, he might. Damn it. He might. I, I'm okay with that, though, man. Oh, I mean, good. if that's your thing, it's good with me. It's going to so. be my interpretation of how she dresses. And she wears a bagel costume. Hey, that oh, she inspired man. you so much that you'd want to dress like her. Yeah. Hey, that says a lot to me, man. Nice. And you should go for it. <laughs> so, Hey, man, thanks a lot. Hey, thank you, guys. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. It was an honor to hang out with you. Thanks. A lot of fun. Yeah. Guys are cool. So, hey, everybody, Michael David Warden.